Good morning, everyone. It's very nice to see all of you here today. So today we will talk about, we will learn about something called black holes. This is something that you have probably uh, heard about in popular uh, lectures, in YouTubes, or even in newspapers. So let's learn today all about it. Not all, maybe some. So to begin with, what is a black hole? A black hole, the definition goes like this. A black hole is a region in space-time where the gravity is so strong that nothing, not even light, can escape it. So this is a definition that you will see everywhere. But let's try to understand this definition. So we said that nothing can escape this gravity. What do we mean by escaping gravity? So let's say that you have a stone in your hand and you throw it upwards. It goes a little bit of distance, then it comes down because Earth has gravity and the gravity is attracting the stone downwards. If you throw it with a bit more force, if you give it a bit much more initial velocity, so it goes a little bit further up before coming down. So if you keep giving it more and more velocity, it keeps going more and more distance before coming down. And then there comes a point where you give it so much velocity that it just escapes Earth's gravitational pull forever and ever. It just goes to the space and never comes down. That particular velocity, the minimum velocity by which you can do that is called an escape velocity here. Escape velocity is given by this formula. So it is saying that the escape velocity is equal to root over 2 gm by r, where m is the mass of the earth and r is the radius of the earth. Okay? So it only depends on these two quantities. So here, let's try to guess. What do you think should be the velocity of the rock if it wants to just escape Earth's gravity forever? Raise your hand when I say each of these options, okay? It, it just guess. You don't need to know the answer or anything. So what speed the rock needs to have to escape Earth's gravity? Who thinks it is 40 kilometers per hour? If you think so, raise your hand. Okay? Okay. Who thinks it is 400 kilometers per hour? Okay, I see a few. 4,000 kilometers per hour. I see quite a few hands. What about 40,000 kilometers per hour? I see a lot more hands. Okay, so seems like the vote is 40,000 kilometers per hand. Okay, is that the truth? You guys were right. So if we do the calculations, if we put all the numbers in that formula, it comes out that the escape velocity of Earth is 11.2 kilometers per second or about 40,000 kilometers per hour. This is a tremendous amount of velocity. The normal local trains, they go like 40 kilometers per hour. Like the fastest train in the world, they go like 500 kilometers per hour. So 40,000 kilometers per hour is a lot of velocity that we don't see every day. Now, remember that formula that we said, so V is equal to root over 2 gm by r. So if m increases, V increases, and we see this here. So for r, it is 11 kilometer per second. But if you wanted to escape sun's gravity, you will have to acquire a velocity of 617 kilometers per second, or about 22 lakhs kilometer per hour a huge amount of velocity. You have to go very, very fast. So if you take some other celestial body, which is even more massive, say something called neutron star, this is a type of star which is very massive. So to escape its gravitational field, you have to go one lakh kilometer per second. So if you think about it a little bit more, then you can come to this idea that what if there is an object for which the escape velocity is the more than the speed of light. Now, we know from Einstein's theory of relativity that nothing in the 
whole of the universe can have a speed more than the speed of light. So, if the escape velocity is more than the speed of light, that means that nothing is able to escape this body. Nothing meaning no rockets, no particles, no photons, no kind of light or radiation, nothing can escape this body. We see all the stars in the sky because light escapes from them and then reaches us. It reaches our eyes or our telescope, then we can see the stars. But for this kind of bodies, it will not emit any light. It will not allow anything to escape it. So it will be completely black. And this is a black hole. The ideas of black hole are old. The first such idea was proposed by an English astronomer, John Michel. Around 1783, so Newton was in 1600s, so he gave the theory of gravitation and Michel knew about the gravitational theory. He knew about the concept of escape velocity and he was thinking like you guys are thinking right now, that okay, escape velocity, if it is more than speed of light, then nothing will escape it. So he called these things dark stars. Few years later, French mathematician Pierre Laplace also came up with similar ideas. But these were very theoretical thinking. And uh, these were quite ahead of their time. After this, 100 years passed and not much progress happened in this field. Until Einstein appeared in the scene of physics. In 1915, he proposed general theory of relativity. General theory of relativity was groundbreaking science. It teaches us to look at whole of the space and time in a completely new manner. And this theory predicts the existence of black holes, theoretically. Around that time, so 1915, you know that the first world war was happening from 1914 to 1918. And physicist Karl Schwarzschild at this time was actually fighting in the war. So in the war front itself, he heard about this news that Einstein has proposed this new theory of general relativity. So he was very much interested in this theory. He got all the papers and then he did calculations. He solved the equations of general relativity and then he gave us the first mathematical formulations of black holes. So his work was very important in this field. But one year later, he passed away in the war front. Few more years later, uh, another astronomer comes in the scene. He is Indian-American astronomer, you probably have heard about, Subramaniam Chandrasekhar. He worked in the field of how stars die. So he gave us a lot of scientific formulations of what could be the end stage of stars. And then he also talked about how black holes may form. Even in that time, these ideas were revolutionary. The famous astronomers of this time did not believe his ideas. His ideas were ridiculed quite a lot. But he stuck to his point that this is what math is showing. And many years later, in 1983, he would go on to win the Nobel Prize for these calculations. But as the decades progressed, more and more physicists and astronomers started to work in the field of black holes. And black holes kind of began to materialize in the field that, okay, this may be something, not just science fiction, but maybe science. But so far, nobody has seen a black hole. Now, how do you see a black hole? I mean, theory is all good. Uh, mathematics is showing, okay, it may exist, but seeing it is different matter. The, the basic of black hole says that black hole do not emit any light. And we see all the things in the sky like stars and galaxies because they emit light, some kind of light, right? So how would you see a black hole? First, it doesn't give light. And also math says that it is extremely tiny, like only a few kilometers across. So among the vast expanse of completely dark universe, how do you find something so tiny and completely dark? 
So this was a big problem for all astronomers. But astronomers also knew that its gravity is very strong. So they postulated this, okay. So because the gravity is so strong that if something is around the black hole, it may affect it gravitationally. So say there is a black hole and this star is around it, then just like Earth goes around the sun, it will force the star to go around itself. So if you see a star rotating around some unseen invisible companion, then this means that there must be a black hole here. There is another thing here that there could be a lot of gas, there is a lot of gas in the universe. So there could be a lot of gas around these black holes. And then this gas when it comes very near the black hole, it falls in. As it falls in, it gets very hot. And hot gas, these hot gas can emit x-rays. X-ray we can detect, right? So this infalling gas can be very bright. So we can maybe see that. So this is the thing. So then the astronomers then started to look out for. Can we find something that uh, follows either this or that? As it turns out, they did find something. In 1971, they found this binary system. Binary meaning there are two things. So they found a very big blue star going around something that cannot be seen. They also found that a lot of X-rays are coming from this area. This system is called the Cygnus X1. It took about 15 years to confirm that indeed this is a black hole. So it's the first observation of black holes. Since then, a bunch of black holes have been observed. But that observation is an indirect observation, right? Because we're seeing something, some effect of the black hole, not the black hole itself. People were trying to see the black hole, meaning the neighborhood of the black hole for a long time. And they succeeded finally, four years ago in 2019. You may remember that there were a lot of news uh, around that time that Event Horizon Telescope, EHT, has seen the first black hole image. This is that first black hole image. What we are seeing here, in, we cannot see the black hole itself, which is somewhere here in the center. But what we are seeing here is light in the vicinity of black hole that gets bent and makes like this ring-like formation. So we see the light which is very close to the black hole. So this is kind of the first direct image of the black hole. This black hole lives in this galaxy, not in our galaxy, in a different galaxy called M87, which is like 55 million light years away from us. It's very far and this black hole is very big, like millions of times bigger than our sun. So now that we know something about black holes, how they were discovered and what they are, we want to learn how do they form. Now you may have heard that black holes are the end products of stellar evolution. They form when stars die. But not all stars will become black holes. So which star does become a black hole? And how do we know that? And why does that happen? To know the answer to all of these questions, we need to know basically the life cycle of a star. How do the stars born, grow up, and then die? So let's go through this. The birth of stars. If you ever get a chance to look at a completely dark sky, you may be able to see that there are some fuzzy objects in the sky. They look like tiny clouds up there. They are clouds, but they are not clouds in our Earth. They are very much farther away, deep into the space. These fuzzy things are called nebula. Nebulas are clouds of gas and a lot of dust is also inside it. They look spectacular in these images. 
So, this is an example of a nebula called Eagle Nebula. This picture was taken by James Webb Space Telescope, which is one of the most powerful telescope. And this is another nebula called Orion Nebula. So, in this gas cloud, stars are born. How? So, we have here, what we have here is a big gas cloud, okay. So, this gas cloud just keeps floating in the space for millions of years, just happily, just lazily, it just stays there. But at some point, it becomes very heavy. So, then it cannot stay in their whole shape and it fragments. It, be, it breaks into pieces like this, say. Even these pieces at this point are quite big and big meaning they are massive. Mass means that they have a lot of gravity. Now, in this whole story, gravity is a very important aspect. Gravity is always trying to push everything towards the center. That's gravity. So, what it starts to do is all of these little, little cloud fragments, gravity is trying to say each of the things to say smoosh down, to contract. When this gas contracts, it gets very, very hot. When, so, this gas is mostly hydrogen. So, what happens? Let us see the video and then we will talk a bit more. So, this is a simulation done by some astronomers. So, this huge gas cloud, it breaks apart and then stars are forming here. So, what happens is that this gas becomes very, very hot and then the hydrogen starts to fuse into helium. The fusion process starts and at this point we say that a star is born. What do we mean by the fusion process? So, some of you may already know, but you may not be familiar with this. So, in fusion, hydrogen becomes helium. How exactly? So, a hydrogen atom has one proton and one electron. And a helium atom has two of each, two protons, two neutrons and two electrons. So, at certain temperature, so normally the protons all have positive charge and you know that positive charges repel each other. They do not like to come near each other, right. But if the whole thing is heated in the very high temperature, the protons that the hydrogens are moving very, very fast. And in these conditions, protons can come together. They can come together and bond and form another thing. So, four protons here inside stars, they come together and form a helium nuclei. This is called the fusion reaction. Now, as it turns out that the total mass of these four things and the total mass of this thing is not the same. The, the total mass of one helium nuclei is a little bit less than what we put in here. So, where does this little less mass go? It is about less by about 0.7 percent. But we know that mass is conserved always. Mass cannot just lose, we cannot just lose mass. So, Einstein again comes into the picture and he has told us that mass and energy are basically the same thing. So, this little mass gets converted into energy following the E is equal to mc square. So, that little mass, the lost mass becomes energy and this energy is the source of all light and heat from the star. So, this is how nuclear fusion is a source of stellar energy. So, at this point, the star has been born, but we remember gravity which was pushing the cloud inwards. Gravity is still there doing its own thing, right. So, the gravity is still pushing everything inwards. But now that the gas has started burning, the gas is very hot and the hot gas moves around a lot. So, this creates a pressure. Pressure means that the gas is now trying to push things outwards. So, these two forces balances, you know, gravity pushing, so it is like a tug of war. 
So, gravity is in that side and gas pressure is in that side and at this point of star's life, they both are like, okay, we both are same and equal in force. So, the star is balanced. This is the main stage of a star's life. A star can spend billions of years in this phase. Our sun currently is in this phase and has been in this phase for like 5 billion years now. So, all is good for the star until you can see where this is going that the gas inside a star can run out. It is not, it, it's a lot of gas, but it's not an infinite amount. So, after billions and billions of years, the gas, the hydrogen gas inside it will run out. Now, like just like petrol in a car, when the petrol runs out, then the car cannot go anymore. And so, for stars also, when the hydrogen runs out, it cannot burn anymore. Then, in the previous picture, gas pressure is gone now. Gravity is there. Now, gravity then starts to push things inward again. So, at this point, several things happen in the star. The core of the star where the hydrogen was burning, so all the hydrogen has become helium now, right? So, it is full of helium, gravity is pushing it inwards a lot. There still is though some hydrogen left in the outer atmosphere. The outer atmosphere of the star previously was not hot enough to burn the hydrogen, but now that gas is even now becoming contracted, this little hydrogen left in the outside, it now is hot enough and then that fuses and this little hydrogen becomes helium, makes pressure outside and this puffs up the star. This puffs up the star a lot at this point and this becomes like a big giant. It looks also red. So, we call this stage the red giant. It can become very, very huge and in sun's case, it will become so huge that it will even eat up our planet. So, let us look at this video and see what happens. A red giant star has been formed and this planet, say Earth, was going around this, around this, star is getting bigger and bigger and bigger until it reaches the planet and basically eats it. So, that is the red giant phase. Okay, so the star has popped up and star has maybe eaten some of its planets and what is happening inside. So, at some point all this, this little bit of hydrogen that was left has also become helium. Okay, so helium is everywhere. Now what? What happens now is, okay, so again nothing is there to balance gravity. So, gravity is, thing, is pushing things inwards. Now, the helium starts to get very hot. Temperature shoots very, very high like 100 million degrees, like 1 crore degrees, right. At this point, helium itself can start to burn. Like before, hydrogen was burning into helium. Now, 3 helium atoms can come and make carbon. So, now we have a new fuel, new source. So, that is the helium. So, when helium is burning, now this can create some pressure like before and this can hold up gravity for some time. So, let us see what is happening. So, first you have the star, normal star that means that inside hydrogen is becoming helium pushing gravity. Okay. So, and then in the end everything becomes helium. So, the star is in trouble, it gets contracted and then the helium is so hot, now it starts to make carbon, right. Okay. So, now when all the helium becomes carbon, again helium fuel is lost now. Now what happens? Again there is nothing to balance gravity, so gravity starts pushing things inwards and so the star starts to get smaller and smaller. Now, you may ask, okay, but we can think that, okay, so if it gets even more hotter, 
why don't the carbon burn? Maybe the carbon will burn into something, which does happen in some stars. But in stars like Sun, it is not massive enough. It is, so it doesn't have enough gravity to make it so hot that the carbon can burn. So in these kinds of stars, this is the end stage of all fuel. Nothing can burn after this. So what happens is, at this point, there is no fuel left. Gravity pushes things inward a lot. It gets shrunk like from a sun-like size to earth size. But then it encounters another unexpected rival, which is quantum mechanics. At this point, the star is very small. Now, we know that inside the star there is a lot of gas, means a lot of electrons are also there. So this, it is so hot inside that the atoms are supposed to have the electrons bound in their nuclei, right, bound around their nuclei. But it is so hot that the, generally all the electrons are stripped off. They just go around doing their own thing. It's like an electron soup inside. So normally, the soup of electrons has a lot of space to move around, not a problem. Quantum mechanics, so these electrons are very tiny particles and they ha have to follow the rule of quantum mechanics. Now quantum mechanics has one specific rule. It says that no two electrons can ever occupy the same state, which means that no two electrons can occupy the same space and also move around in the same way. So say that normally the electrons have a lot of space to move around. It's okay. But when the star has shrunk a lot, now the electrons have no more space to move around, no more space to go. It's like you are in a bus and the bus is super duper crowded, right? And the conductor is just telling, okay, there is space, there is space, yes, come on in, come on in. But at some point the bus is full, right? Okay, at this point even now, but the gravity, which is the conductor, let's say, it's like, okay, you can push, you can push, you can become smaller. But the people, uh, say the bus passengers are now saying, there is no more space, man, like, why would I even go? So that's exactly what the electrons are saying to the gravity now. And then they, like, if you now try to push this crowd even more, then the crowd kind of pushes back. You cannot push them more. So this pressure, now electrons start to push back, right? So this is the pressure of electrons. So at this point, the pressure of electrons for these stars can now balance the gravity. So in the tug of war, gravity remains, but its opponent has been changed from gas pressure to now it is electron pressure. And for these kinds of stars, electron pressure is enough to balance gravity. This is called a white dwarf. This is the end stage for these kinds of stars. They can remain in this phase for billions and billions of years. A white dwarf is very massive and very dense. In this picture, this is a real white dwarf and the picture is not real though. This real white dwarf is more massive than sun but its size is comparable to our moon. A teaspoon of white dwarf, it has a weight of 5,000 kg. So you can imagine how dense and how small this can be. The properties of white dwarf were first calculated by Chandrasekhar again. And Chandrasekhar told us that the highest mass of a white dwarf can be about 1.4 times of our sun. So anything smaller than this will become a white dwarf. But anything bigger, what happens to those? The fate of massive stars is a bit different than sun-like stars. Massive stars also go through the same phase. First there is hydrogen which burns into helium, then helium which burns into carbon. It has more gravity, so can then again, carbon can burn into something else, like oxygen and so on. So if you have a periodic table, it will just go on following the periodic table until it reaches like iron. 
But at some point, at that point, even for the massive stars, its fuel will run out. What happens then? In a massive star, there is more mass, so there is more gravity. Right. So the gravity here is drawn as like bigger arrows. So in the tug of war, this gravity person is now like a bigger and more you know, uh, powerful person. So now it again follows the same step, contracts. Now electron starts to give pressure, but here electron pressure is not enough. So gravity pushes it in and then something interesting happens. Electrons have no other space to go, right, like we said. So electrons can do only one thing. There is a lot of protons in the star. Electrons then bind together with protons. All electrons bound together with all the protons and make neutrons. So the whole of star now become full of neutrons. Now you may know that in an atomic nucleus, Neutron, the nucleus uh, in an atom, the nucleus occupy a very, very little space, like say a tennis ball compared to a football field, which is all the space that the electrons take. So when all the electrons come together and form neutrons in the nuclei, so it becomes like very small all of a sudden. So from a radius of about say 10,000 uh, 10, kilometers, so it, this was earth size, so 10,000 kilometers to, it becomes, shrinks to about 10 kilometers. So then it is full of neutrons. Now neutrons are also very tiny particles, has to follow quantum mechanics and has to follow the same rule that no two neutrons can be in the same state. So in this tiny star now, the neutrons now start to give pressure that okay, enough is enough, I cannot go inside further. And in these kinds of stars, this neutron pressure can now balance gravity. And now we have reached a different end product which is called a neutron star. Neutron stars are quite fascinating thing, but before we go to the neutron star's properties, let's recap this, that there were a lot of electrons, protons hanging around, say it's like art size, and suddenly it falls in, suddenly it falls in, when electrons becomes neutrons, right? So the fall of all the matter happens in a great speed, like fraction of light speed even. And it falls, become very small, and the neutron is like, okay, stop. It's like a train is going tra in tremendous speed, and suddenly it hits a wall. This means that there will be a lot of shock for the train. This, is, this will be a train accident, and the train will get crumpled, right? Like we see in accident pictures. So something similar happens here. So all these materials here, falls in and encounters this barrier, so a lot of shock now gets produced. Shock and some energetic particles called neutrinos gets produced and then travel outwards. Now there were still some of the stars left behind. This shock is now so powerful that it just blows apart the rest of the stars. It creates a giant explosion. The giant explosion is called supernova. What does it look like? So a star, something is happening inside, the explosion. And after the explosion, this is what remains. A supernova explosion is a tremendous event. It can, this, the light of this explosion can be about as bright as 100 billions of suns. In a galaxy, if a supernova explosion happens, at that point of explosion, it will be brighter than the entire galaxy. If a supernova happens at, at the sky today, tonight, you will be able to see. You will be able to see it. Like such an explosion happened in 1987, and that supernova was clearly visible from Earth. Supernova explosion is also interesting 
because it throws away the stellar material, right? And so far we have learned that inside the star, a lot of things are well being made, like carbon, oxygen, iron, etc. And this is how all these things that were being made inside the stars gets out into the space. In the space, in the beginning, there were only hydrogen and maybe a little bit of helium, but nothing else. Only inside of stars, all of these other, all the other elements, all the other atoms are created inside the stars. And in supernova, all of these things can get out. Now, after millions and millions of years, planets can form in those spaces. They can take that carbon, that uh, uh, iron and all of that material inside, it take it and then make planets like Earth. So all the carbon that is inside our body and all of the atoms that you see around us were made inside of stars at some point. And this is why they say that we literally are made of star stuff. So we talked about neutron stars. Neutron stars are very small, like a size of the city. So here we can compare it to a New York City or it is size of the Pune city, about 10 kilometers. They also rotate very, very fast. Uh, they are, so one teaspoon of neutron star has like a trillion kilometer kg weight. So, and they can also give light like this, like a lighthouse. Oh, they call it pulsars. So we have, uh, we have seen these things uh, in astronomy. And then, if the star is big enough, massive enough, the gravity cannot be stopped even by neutrons. And after neutrons, there is nothing left. The tug of war then is won by gravity. Gravity now contracts everything and everything is forced to collapse into one single point. A black hole is born. A black hole is gravity's ultimate victory. Gravity has won now forever and ever. So we have finally reached our final product, the black hole. So, so far we were talking about black holes which comes from stars, call it stellar mass black holes. The maximum mass of those kinds of black holes can be about 100 solar mass, 100 suns. But scientists have found another kinds of black holes which are super massive. They have mass about hundreds of thousands to billions of solar mass. These kinds of huge black holes are found in the center of each galaxy. There is one also in the center of our galaxy, which is our galaxy is Milky Way. And we are here, our, our Earth is here, about 26,000 light years from us in the center there is a black hole called Sagittarius A. So how pe people found this black hole is an interesting story. So again, we can't see the black hole itself. So astronomers were looking at all the stars in the central area for a long time. So you can see that it starts from 1995 and then they keep taking pictures of stars. Uh, so what they're seeing is how the stars move here. So if you follow say the yellow star, so the yellow star here, like it comes from here and then it makes a circle. So we, we can see that the stars here are doing something, they are orbiting some invisible point. And from these orbits, you can actually calculate what the mass of this invisible object is. This invisible object is this star thing here. And they found out there is a black hole and its mass is huge, four million times of our sun. And this is how they, it was discovered. So science can of sometimes take very, very long time to find a, an interesting result. But you have to be patient. Now how these things form is not very well known. We don't know exactly how it happens. Uh, there are no stars so big like billions of times of sun that can collapse into a black hole. That cannot happen. So something else might be going on. So scientists have a few theories. So say, they say sometimes, some scientists say that when the universe was very young, a long, long time ago, when only the first stars were being formed, 
The first stars maybe may have been a lot more massive than what we see today. Those first stars may have formed uh, quite massive black holes, these black holes, and then they, a lot of gas may have fallen in over billions and billions of years, and the black hole grew in size until they reach this supermassive size. But some other people say that uh, no, actually, there were so much gas in the young universe that the gas just directly, the gravity just uh, took all the gas in and make it a black hole directly without being a star. And that black hole also again ate a lot of gas and become supermassive. So which one of these theory is true? If any of this is true, we don't know. So a lot of open questions remains in the field. What is the size of the black hole? Black hole, everything goes into a point, yes. But in some of the pictures we have shown like a big kind of black thing, right, a round thing. So when we say the size of a black hole, it means that remember the escape velocity that we talked about, right. So uh, away from black hole, so if the black hole is here, a bit away from it, you can imagine a sphere. On that sphere, if you calculate the escape velocity, if the escape velocity is exactly equal to the speed of light, then this size, this distance is what we call the size of a black hole. So the event horizon is an imaginary line around the black hole where the escape velocity is equal to c. The black hole itself is concentrated in a point which is called singularity. Now, so anything inside the event horizon can never get out, but anything outside the event horizon is fine. Like if you are much further away, it's okay. The size of this depends on the size of, on the mass of the black hole. Say for if the mass is 10 sun, the size is 30 kilometer, but the, if the mass is like 10 lakh suns, like a supermassive black hole, the size is like 30 lakh suns. So the size can be as big as like our whole solar system or even bigger. So question for you, if the sun is replaced right now by a black hole of one, one solar mass, do you think the earth will get sucked into it? Okay, who says yes, raise your hand. Okay, and who says no? Okay, I see about equal votes. So you remember what we said that, uh, so what is, so for to answer this, we need to know what is the event size of the event horizon. So if the mass is 10 sun, the size is 30 kilometers. If the mass is one sun, the size is three kilometers. So the event size of event horizon for this black hole is only three kilometers, but we are like millions of kilometers away, right? So we will not be get sucked in. There will be no light, but so this is a misconception that black holes can suck everything around it, but that's not true. Only if you are very close to the event horizon, you will be sucked into the black hole, but otherwise you can keep going around and around like those stars were going around and around. So um, some details about gravity. We talked a lot about gravity in this lecture. So um, there is a model outside and we can explain using the model better. But just to give you an idea that when we say there is gravity, what do we mean? So Newton just said that any two bodies which have mass attracts each other. But why? This why is a very, very tough question to answer. So Einstein thought a lot about this, that why gravity does what it does. And what he came, come, came up is a revolutionary idea. So what he was saying is that, say, we see space all around us. The space is three dimensional. Now we know that to say anything, say where the bulb is, you can say from my position, go like 10, mid, go like 10 feet here, two feet in this direction and 20 feet up. We need three numbers to say where the bulb is. But say you are trying to invite your friend to this lecture, you will have to say that it is in the Chandrasekhar Auditorium, which is the space. You will also have to say that it is on this day and at 10 a.m. 
So we also have to say a time. So each of the event, all the events has a space and time associated with it and Einstein postulated that space time is basically one entity. So he called it space time and he says that any mass which is put in a space time warps a space time. So like if we, if we think of space time as a sheet of fabric, a cloth, if you put like a mass like sun, it then carves the fabric, it like creates a valley. And anything which goes, which moves, it has to follow this fabric. Like light also has to follow this fabric. So the sun can make a little bit of a dip. White dwarf is more massive, so it creates a much more dip. And neutron star is even more massive, so the depth is much more. So for a light to get out, so what it does is, it comes from here, it goes down and then it can come out. It has to follow this, this path though. It cannot just go like this, it can't. And for a black hole, it makes a valley which is so deep that is infinite depth. So that's why, so if a light just goes in and go enters this hole, the black hole, passes the event horizon, then it just goes down infinitely. It can never come out and that's why light cannot come out of the black hole. This theory can also explain that if you have like a big mass and you give some little thing, little ball, like a little bit of velocity, it will go around and around. So there is a, a model outside, you can play with it after the lecture and see how planets move around the sun, for example. So uh, finally, so these kinds of space time, uh, it, we can see it also in something called gravitational wave. Say two black holes are going around each other, then this fabric, you see like if you throw a pebble, it creates waves. So this thing is also creating waves and the whole of the sheet is making a lot of ripples. These ripples are called gravitational wave. We can detect it and such a big detector is going to come to India. This is called uh, experiment called LIGO India and as it turns out the LIGO India, this mega project is coming to Maharashtra in the Hingoli district. This is being built now. It will take a few years to uh, open this fully and maybe by that time some of you will go and work there. And using this gravitational wave, we can find out a lot, ab lot about the black holes that made the gravitational wave. So we end this talk by one video where we will see that there are so many different sizes of black holes, small to huge. This is a comparison of the size of the event horizon. So sun, this black hole is like a sun size and so on. So this is the orbit of the Mercury. This black hole is the black hole of this Arsinus galaxy. So this is the orbit of Earth. Now we have another black hole here, which is the size of, uh, which is the black hole of M32 galaxy. This is the asteroid belt. The Milky Way black hole is so big. You see the size of it. This is black holes of another galaxy. Now we have reached the outer space of solar system. Huge black holes are now you can see. This black hole, much bigger than our solar system. Andromeda galaxy is black hole like this. The Oort cloud, which is far outside of the solar system, M87, which this is the one that they saw in uh, Event Horizon Telescope. And finally, this one is uh, one of the largest black holes in the universe. Uh, this is far, far bigger than our solar system. So thank you. And we have our social channels.
Uh, yes, sir. Uh, I hope you have enjoyed the lecture. Uh, uh, we will be uh, uh, presented by the uh, uh, on the animation. Uh, uh, we can uh, like to take a few questions. We have uh, around uh, 8 to 10 minutes with us. Uh, anyone want to ask any question? Uh, okay, is here to answer. Please uh, ask your questions. Yeah, so actually the answer is we don't know. We don't know exactly what happens inside the event horizon. So once it passes the event horizon, we think that it, it probably goes into the circularity point. But at this point, our current physics cannot definitively predict what happens. There are like exotic scenarios like will it come out of a white hole or something. But uh, we cannot say it uh, at this point. Thank you. What is the end of a black hole? The end of a black hole, mm, interesting question. For a long time, people thought there is no end of a black hole. Black hole will just remain forever and ever. But then another scientist, Stephen Hawking, he proposed this theory that in some way, which is very counterintuitive, black holes can lose their mass slowly, slowly. So this is called a Hawking radiation. This is also a quantum mechanical phenomena. So it says that there is, uh, like if you have empty space, generally, uh, you, ha you will see that in quantum mechanics says that even in empty space, there is some fluctuations. So out of nothing, two particles can come out, like an electron and a positron. Same mass, opposite, si opposite size, uh, opposite uh, charge. Like, so these kinds of virtual particles can come in, and uh, so one of these can go into black hole, one of these can come, kind of come out of a black hole, like it is outside of a black hole. So in this way, like in the net effect is that black hole can decide that it is giving some type of radiation. So over a very, very, very long time, like hundreds of billions of years, black hole will lose their mass and then it will become nothing. Are dimensions connected to the black hole? So the black holes, uh, yeah, so our dimension meaning that our space is three dimensional. Black hole is also in this three dimensional space. You can, we, we can think of this three dimension plus the time as one dimensional space time, but it is a real thing. Like, if you had a spaceship which had enough power, you can actually go and see the black hole. So it is uh, in our dimension only. Can we move into the black hole and change or move into another dimension, another like bigger one kind of spot? Can we enter through the black hole and get to the another world? Ah, so uh, can we enter the black hole? Uh, entering has a lot of problems. I mean, without that, even the technical things like how can you reach there. Uh, so if you, if you try to go inside a black hole, the gravity is so strong that uh, like if the black hole is here, it will attract my head with much more force than, our, uh, than my feet. So I will be stretched. So any person who goes, it will be here, they will be stretched like a big noodle. Like they call it spaghettification. And so basically they will die before going to the black hole. But if we could go into the black hole, hypothetically, now does it uh, connect? So some people think that there may be a connection like a wormhole that like the black hole is here, but there is wormhole and then something comes out, which is a white hole at a totally different part of the universe. These are scenarios which are not ruled out. General relativity says it can happen. But we don't know if it does, though. We have never observed it. What happens if like, there are two black holes with the same size? Uh, are they uh, like close to each other? Will they move around each other or collide to make a supermassive black hole? Yes, they will, they will move around each other. Like that video that we were showing, they will go around each other really, really fast. And then they will collide and become one big black hole. Ma'am, my question is that uh, as the video you have shown, so the 
why the black hole doesn't pull the solar system? Means you know that the the black hole which is near to us is uh, Cygnus, X1. So why doesn't it pull the solar system or any other planet near to us? So the black hole has a very strong gravity, but it is only very strong. You will see it's uh, like it pulls things around only if you are very close to it. Far from this, far from the black hole, like if you are much, much farther than the event horizon, it behaves as any other body. Like even sun and the stars have a lot of gravitational field. It will be just like that. So the, these kinds of effects are only apparent when you are very close. So like if you have a supermassive black hole like this, this one, so this one is like bigger than the, our solar system. So in this case, it will eat all the things inside. Do time get affected on the orbit of the black hole? Ah, another important thing that we did not get time to talk about, time does get affected. Uh, in the black hole or around the black hole. So another prediction of general relativity is that space time gets warped like we saw this fabric gets warped, time also does. So it says that the stronger the gravity, the slower the clock. So if like you go near a black hole, your clock will move slow. So maybe you have seen interstellar movie, it is just like that that he, there maybe your clock will say one hour has passed, but when you return to earth, it will be like eight years have passed. This is a true effect. As you said about the supernova, uh, as you said about the supernova, like all the stellar elements are thrown out. So is it possible that those uh, elements get uh, contracted due to their own gravity and make another star or Great question. Actually, it can. So at that moment, it gets thrown out in a like very like explosive fashion. So like it, it, so for gravity to ha happen, uh, it needs to be like uh, nearby. So at that moment, things are getting uh, like really far. But after some time, those things can again come together, and they, that can make a nebula again, and the whole process can begin again. In fact, this is one of the ways that stars actually get recycled. Okay, last question. Now, are black holes connected to white holes? This is a hypothetical scenario. We don't know. So, white holes, if you guys don't know, so it's a hypothetical thing. It's like the opposite of a black hole that nothing can fall into a white hole. Everything can just, everything always just comes out of a black hole. So this is a scenario that is permitted by mathematics. Math say it can exist, but we have never seen it. So we don't really. Last question. Now, can the black holes transport us to another world, or we can uh, discover the past or the future? Time travel. Uh, uh, yeah. So one kind of time travel is like the time travel of interstellar, you, like we are saying. So you go to the black hole, you spend there like one day, and then you come back, 100 years have passed. So it's kind of like a, you re, uh, come back to the future. So you have like time travel to the future. So that's one kind of thing that can definitely happen. But going to the past is much more tricky. So some hypothetical scenarios say that if there is a black hole and you can go through the wormhole to a white hole, maybe you have traveled to the past. But these are very uh, exotic things that we don't really know the answer to.